Questions, comments, and considerations from the assembled August group, even though it's only May. Anybody have anything? You're going once, twice. All right. Passage of the day. Find the book of Hebrews. When you do, go to chapter 11. The passage is the entire chapter. Give it a quick perusal. Good year. Good year. Grandfather was born in 1883. There you go. Good deal. This is uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is one of the very well regarded greatest chapters of the Bible. Um, there are various uh, combinations or uh, groupings of these chapters, um, remembering, of course, that chapter divisions are not divine, were not instituted by God or human-made. But in some cases, the uh, human uh, dividing up uh, the, the books into chapters did a really good job. In some cases, not so much. But anyway, in some cases, really good job. And uh, we will look at uh, various of these greatest chapters as time goes on. Uh, one of these days, we may even have a whole series of it. Who knows? Uh, I kind of collect them as they come along. Anyway, uh, Hebrews 11 is, is one of those that just about every list, it doesn't really matter whether you're looking at a uh, a Lutheran list, a Baptist list, a, you know, Roman list, it really doesn't matter. Uh, or, uh, you know, just almost everybody includes Romans or, uh, uh, Hebrews 11. Uh, Romans 8 is another one that almost everybody includes. But Hebrews 11 is one of those that is uh, uh, really uh, well regarded, as I say, and uh, very helpful. I uh, very often uh, uh, assign it or, or uh, in, uh, encourage very strongly people to read that that are going through tough times, uh, especially the end of it for, for that reason. But uh, let's take a quick look and kind of make a mental note of the names as we go through the names, okay? Because the names are, are it's a fascinating uh, kind of a thumbnail sketch of the whole Bible, really. Uh, at least the Old Testament and a good part of the New. So, first of all, is the definition of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Um, so, uh, the translation here is okay. It's, it's a good one. But, um, the word proof is uh, maybe better. Um, faith is the proof of things uh, hoped for, or uh, of things that are no evidence, uh, things uh, with, that have no evidence, that have no visible uh, evidence, okay? This is a good definition of faith, okay? Uh, faith is uh, you, you don't see, and yet you believe, as Jesus uh, said concerning Thomas. Um, Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet have believed. Really, really good, solid um, unmistakable definition of faith. Uh, verse 3, um, that do we understand the worlds were prepared or made, created by God, uh, the Word of God. Uh, and I always like to uh, uh, encourage people to capitalize that uh, word, word, uh, because uh, we know that the Word, the second member of the Trinity, was the person of the Trinity that carried out the uh, orders of the first member of the Trinity to bring things into existence. So that what is seen is not made out of what is visible. This is what we call creation ex nihilo. 
Nihilo is a Latin term which means from nothing. Uh, the Latins understood, the Romans and, and others, uh, ancient people understood uh, that creation was not uh, using pre-existing uh, material, even pre-existing energy, if you will. Okay? So, so the creation, the ancients, even the pagans, understood that creation was from nothing. Okay? Uh, now it starts the list, and the first name on the list is Abel. Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, uh, through which he's righteous. And uh, through, even though he's dead, he still speaks. Um, it does not say why uh, Abel's sacrifice was better than Cain's. Neither does the Genesis story tell us. It just tells us God was pleased with Abel's sacrifice and not pleased with Cain's sacrifice. Anything that we infer from what happens after that is just that, an inference. Uh, the fact that Cain had a temper, uh, the fact that he was jealous of his brother, uh, and the fact, of course, that he murdered him um, and whined afterwards, oh, gee, everybody's going to beat me up. Um, anything that we take from that and apply as to why the sacrifice was unacceptable is just that. It's, it's a guess. So we really don't know. It, it, it could be that there was nothing really sac wrong with the sacrifice. It's possible. It's possible this was just a test from God. Nothing more than that. Maybe, you know, Cain didn't do anything wrong as far as the sacrifice is concerned, but uh, God just decided not to accept it for whatever reason. It was his choice. Um, on the other hand, it's also possible that Cain's sacrifice could have been uh, less than stellar, shall we say, uh, or motivations might have been not so good. But again, all of that's just a guess. We're not told. All we're told is that Abel's was better. That's all we're told. Uh, Enoch is the next one. Enoch, uh, and not much is said about Enoch, of course, in the whole Bible, uh, mentioned very briefly in Genesis and then here in uh, uh, Hebrews. Um, he was not found. God took him up. Um, he was pleasing to God. And uh, for this, go back up to verse 2 real quick. Just notice that. Uh, men of God gained approval uh, for by it. What was it? Well, faith. So this is the key to the whole chapter. All right. So Enoch did not go to heaven because he was better than everyone else. He was certainly righteous. But then again, so was Adam. So was Noah. Uh, I mean, if anybody's going to earn uh, not dying and going to heaven alive, I would think it would be Noah. Uh, certainly, he did more than anyone else that we know of. Uh, so, uh, with Enoch, it's not. It really has nothing to do with what he did. It has to do with uh, by faith. That's the key. His, his faith was stronger, I guess you could say. Right, yeah, right. Uh, and then verse 6 is an aside that the writer puts in here. Uh, uh, I am of the opinion the writer is Paul, but, but others uh, don't believe that. They give it to somebody else. That's fine. Uh, I don't think it matters at this point, but uh, uh, in case, I think it's Paul. Uh, without faith, it is impossible to please him. This is, folks, the key. This passage right here, Hebrews eleven six, 6, is the key to the sheep and the goats in the Athanasian Creed and everything else where you see uh, Jesus or an apostle or somebody else talking about the people who have done good to heaven, people who have done bad to hell. You see that in the Bible half a dozen times at least, if not more. Okay? And it bothers everybody. Okay? It, it drives people crazy because here we are, especially as Lutherans, being taught over and over and over again that salvation is by faith, not works. And then you have uh, Jesus and others saying, well, those that have done good to heaven, those that have done bad to hell. Uh, you have to always take that those, those passages of heaven and hell, sheep and goats, whatever you want to talk about, and you have to keep it in context with this verse. If you don't, you're going to get messed up. Okay. 
it is impossible for the goats, the unbelievers, to please God. No matter how much good they do, or how much bad they don't do. You know, the, 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 the goats, they say, well, we didn't know you were in prison. We didn't know you were naked. We didn't know you were thirsty. We didn't know you needed food. You know, we, hey, come on. We didn't do anything wrong. All right? And, and, and that's not the point. The point is, you're unbelievers. That's the point. Okay? And it's the same with those uh, on the other side. We, well, I don't remember giving you a cup of water. I don't remember uh, giving you clothes. I don't remember doing this and visiting you in jail. And I don't remember doing this. And again, that's not the point. You did it. You didn't even know you were doing it and you did it. Why? Because you're a believer. Okay? So Hebrews 11.6 always has to be the interpreting verse for all those other verses. Okay? Noah's the next one, of course. Things not seen. Some take that to mean rain had never fallen on earth before. Possible. Can't say it for sure, but it's possible. And so, you know, here God says to Noah, I'm going to make it rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, you know, uh, somebody sarcastically could, could put into uh, Noah's mouth, rain? What's rain? Um, the point is that God told him something was going to happen in hundreds of years, and Noah didn't, didn't uh, hesitate. He started the work. So he didn't see the rain, he didn't see the flood, he didn't see the destruction, he didn't see any of that, but he went ahead and, and acted anyway. Um, and became the heir of righteousness. By faith, Abraham. Again, Abraham had never been to Canaan. Never been, as far as we know, outside the Mesopotamia. Um, but God said, go to the land that you don't even know. I'm, I'm not even going to tell you now what it is. He doesn't tell him until he gets up to Haran. And he spends a lot of years up in Haran before God finally tells him the second step. Oh, now, now keep going. As far as Abraham knew, Haran, uh, where Laban was left behind, uh, Haran was the promised land as far as, as far as he knew until God told him different. So again, not just once, but twice, Abraham said, okay, and followed God even though he did not see where he was going. He lived as an alien in the land of promise uh, with Jacob and, and, uh, and, and Isaac. Um, Eleven, by faith Sarah received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who had promised. She received the ability to conceive. Well, you know, folks, the ability to conceive is different than conceiving. A lot of people out there, a lot of females out there, have the ability to conceive and don't, uh, for whatever reason. But uh, she took action. And even though her and her husband were 100 years old, and they, they say themselves far past the time of, of reproduction. You know, okay, God, whatever. And uh, went ahead and, uh, and uh, conceived a child. Now, uh, that takes faith. That takes a lot of faith. Uh, so, here again, that's the example that we have. Uh, all these, then a little, another a little parenthetical remark again. All these died in faith without receiving the promises. Okay? Now, they received some promises. Noah certainly saw the fulfillment of the flood. Sarah certainly saw the fulfillment of Isaac bo being born. But they didn't receive all the promises. They didn't receive, for example, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not receive the promised land. They were still aliens and foreigners. They did not receive that. Okay. Noah certainly did not see a full world again. Okay. Billions and billions of people. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of promises that they received, but there are a lot of promises they didn't receive yet. They died 
without seeing the fulfillment of those promises. And yet, it says here, they kept believing. Again, that is the epitome of faith. Um, they are seeking a country uh, of their own. This is not, this, this world is not uh, our home. Our home is in heaven. And so, um, uh, while it's fine if you want to save the planet for various reasons, uh, being a good steward, of course, uh, at the same time, uh, we're not going to save the planet. God is going to destroy it, burn it down to its uh, atomic uh, elements uh, to, so nothing exists again. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, too, uh, our, our home is in our heavenly realm, and uh, heaven and earth, and we know at the last day, will be combined. Uh, for a better country, a heavenly one. Uh, back to Abraham, verse 17. Offered up Isaac. What did he tell the servants? He told the servants, we will return. Isaac and I will be back. He assumed that God would allow him to sacrifice Isaac which means, which it's, it's, you have to understand, this is before the Mosaic Law. So the ceremonial way of sacrifice was not yet established. But we do know that the kind or type of sacrifice that was already in use was a bleed out and a full burning. What, what later on became known as a whole burnt offering. And so that's why Abram had a knife. He had a knife to cut uh, Isaac's throat and uh, bleed him out. I'm sure he had him bound on the wood in such a way as that he would bleed out fairly quickly. So Isaac would be drained of blood, just as the animals were when they were sacrificed, and then he would be uh, burned alive, or not burned alive, obviously, but burned uh, completely to ashes. That's a whole burnt offering. It's the earliest and most familiar of the uh, sacrifices in the Old Testament. Abraham was ready and willing to cut his son's throat, bleed him out completely like a stuck pig, and burn him to ashes. But he also believed firmly that he and Isaac, the same Isaac that would be burned to ashes, would go back down the mountain. That's a lot of faith. That, that ranks right up there at the top. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, Isaac himself and uh, Jacob and Esau, uh, all these things. Uh, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed uh, Joseph. Uh, and by faith, Joseph then was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel. 400 years later. So Joseph, he didn't know how many years, most likely, but uh, 400 years into the future. He had no way he saw that. And yet he said, Go ahead and keep my body, and you keep it. You, you keep it. You want to embalm it? Fine, but you keep it. You, keep hang, you hang on to it. And when you leave, whatever that is, when you leave, take me with you. Which is what they did. Moses um, was hidden for three months by his parents, uh, not afraid of the king's edict. Uh, by faith, uh, Moses... Uh, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, we don't know exactly. I mean, Josephus has good tales, and other Jewish sources have uh, stories about uh, how this took place, but the Bible does not say. Uh, all we can infer from this is that at some point in his life in the palace itself, while he was still a prince of Egypt, he let it be known or, or made it a point to say, I am not an Egyptian, I am a Hebrew. We do not think, based on, again, the Bible, not stories, but the Bible, that this was not what cast him out from Egypt, but rather the murder of the Egyptian um, uh, slave master that caused him to be exiled from Egypt. But he endured ill treatment. So we think that uh, before his exile from Egypt, 
Uh, this seems to say that uh, he uh, spent some time with his uh, Jewish brothers and had some ill treatment. Um, he left Egypt, fearing the wrath of the king. Uh, and you might say, fearing the wrath of the king very righteously because he was a murderer. He should have been executed. Uh, but he went to a place unseen. Uh, he kept the Passover, sprinkling the blood. Okay, Again, he did not see the destroyer, the angel of death. He did. He just he just took God at His word. God said, "I'm going to send an angel of death, and anybody whose door is not covered with blood, the firstborn in that house is going to die. No matter if they're a hundred years old or one year old. No matter if they're firstborn of the kitty cats or the firstborn of the dogs or the firstborn of the goats or the firstborn. It doesn't matter. All firstborn in the whole nation is going to die unless there's blood on the posts. And again." He simply took God at His word. He believed and acted on that belief. Passed through the Red Sea. It's on dry land. It must have been hard. You know, I think the movies, uh, Cecil B. DeMille's, both his silent movie and his uh, 1950s epic, uh, capture that a little bit. When you see the people, oh, I ain't go down in there. I ain't go down in there, man. That water is going to fall on us. And, and you, you get a little bit of a sense that, that people were ooh, a little bit reluctant. And Moses had to, and Joshua kind of, hey, come on, guys, come on. It's going to be okay. But it, it, must have taken, it must have taken a lot of, uh, a lot of faith, frankly, uh, to look up at those walls of water that are being held by nothing. There's no pexiglass there, you know. There's no uh, transparent aluminum. Uh, manufactured by Engineer Scott uh, to keep the uh, to keep the walls of water from crashing down on you again. So yeah, that must have taken some uh, bravery there. Walls of Jericho. Next thing. See what I mean? Nice little biblical historical list here. Walls of Jericho um, fell down again by faith. They didn't pull them down. They they fell down. Um, 31, Rahab, Rahab the harlot. Very bold here, and it's, uh, you know, Rahab was a prostitute. She wasn't even, she wasn't even anywhere near the line of, of Abraham. She was a Canaanite. Okay, those are Hamites. Canaanites are Hamites. Abraham and his line are Sethites, uh, Shemites, Semites. Okay? So, so uh, uh, Rahab, Rahab no, had no, uh, no uh, hope, really, uh, of being included in the promise of Abraham. And yet, she accepted uh, that God would be uh, good to her. And, and uh, she welcomed the spies in peace and, and uh, of course, got them out before they were discovered and all that stuff. And then I, lo I love verse 32. Verse 32 uh, and following, really, to the end is just a great conclusion. Okay, and if you read nothing else in Hebrews 11 on a regular basis, read these last verses here. What more shall I say? Time will fail me if I mention Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouth of lions, quenched the power of the fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, not accepting their release, so they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourging, chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sleep, sheepskins, goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill treatment. Men of the world who were not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, note that, gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Some of it, yes, but not all of it. They didn't see the Messiah, if nothing else. Okay? Because God had provided something better for us living now at that time, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect, that complete, a better translation, complete. In other words, their lives on earth were not entirely complete. 
and they wouldn't be complete until the Messiah would come. And that was reserved for that time, the New Testament time. Okay? So again, uh, chapter 11, uh, Hebrews, terrific chapter, fantastic chapter, especially those last verses from 32 to the end. I, I, like I say, and they should be read quickly. They should be read, you know, running on one after the other, after the other, after the other, because it, it, it really gives you a sense. Uh, all of these people, from Adam, uh, certainly, to, uh, to the uh, martyrs in the New Testament that we're looking at on Fridays in our, our newsletter, uh, all of these people uh, are the great cloud of witnesses that we have that uh, faith is uh, our um, uh, anchor in our foundation. Okay. And, and one other thing quickly, uh, notice that all of these people, uh, without fail, all of these people acted on their faith. So again, you see the connection between faith and works. And so we have to admit, James is right. James is right. Faith without works is dead. If there are no works, then what good is faith to you? It doesn't do you any good. But are you saved by the works? No, you're saved by the faith. But because you're saved by the faith, and because you have that faith, you're able to do works. Okay? That's the connection. That's the connection. Faith always has to come first, but it, they are connected. Okay? So, you know, cheap grace and, and uh, lack of works, uh, that, that is a hallmark of, uh, unfortunately, the hallmark of a lot of conservative Christians uh, is wrong. On the other hand, the pietism and uh, uh, that is the hallmark of many progressive Christians is also wrong. Pietism and legalism. Gotta, you got to have that nice, uh, what Luther used to call the nice Lutheran middle. You know, nice Lutheran middle. Faith and works working together. I saw a hand someplace. Where did, oh, Richard. Yes, well, yeah. That no, they don't. No, no, they don't. Like I said, we don't know what Cain's sin was aside from murder. We don't know why, why his uh, sacrifice was, uh, was missing. Uh, uh, Abraham's lies about Sarah uh, are not mentioned, obviously. Uh, David's uh, sin with Bathsheba, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jephthah's. Uh, uh, Jephthah's uh, um, foolish, foolish, foolish oath that was completely unnecessary, uh, whether it caused him to actually uh, sacrifice his daughter, an actual blood sacrifice of, of his daughter, uh, I, don't, I don't believe that myself. I think there's another explanation for it, but still, it was very foolish. And uh, he, he, he did some really dumb things. Um, you know, uh, the others too, for that matter. I mean, you know, P doesn't talk about Peter's denial. doesn't talk about Paul's uh, persecution of the church. Doesn't, I mean, there are a lot of, you're right. There's a lot of things that, about sin that's not there. And they're all kind of glossed over, <laughs> you know. And, and the faith rises to the top, you might say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else? on Hebrews 11. So we'll mark that down, uh, mark that down as a great chapter of the Bible uh, and uh, something that, uh, especially as I say, the last 10 verses, whatever, or so, uh, just really terrific stuff. Uh, in case you get uh, burned out, uh, down and depressed and, uh, you know, just kind of bummed, bummed uh, boy, I tell you, you, you can't do better than that. And Romans 8, of course, too, same thing. Uh, you get, get to the point where you need a little encouragement. Uh, Romans 8, another great chapter of the Bible. Uh, and uh, like I say, one of these days, maybe I'll uh, hand out my list, my personal list of uh, great chapters of the Bible, and uh, we, can, uh, we can go through them maybe. Any case, so that's it. All right, any other questions or comments? Okay, let us go to the next to last denomination and or faith group in Christianity, which is the wonderful Methodists. Thank you. Uh huh. What uh, can anybody tell me one way or the other? 
of your own knowledge and or understanding of this particular tribe of folks. But when, when you hear the term Methodist, what do you think of? You know, we, we kind of talked about the Episcopalians, the Anglicans, the Chosen Frozen. You know, we talked about the Presbyterians being Calvinists and uh, predestination nuts, kind of that, in that, that way, at least the uh, formal ones. What about the Methodists? What, what pops in your head when you... What's that? Oh, okay. A method. Well, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Then, yeah. Uh, which, as you will find out, was a derogatory term applied to them. Just like Lutheran. Uh, Lutheran was a, a derogatory term applied to the Protestants by the Romans. You Lutherans, you. And it was much objected to by Martin Luther and much objected to by most other Lutherans too. They didn't want to be called Lutherans. But the uh, opposition put that name on them and it stuck. Same with the Methodists, as we'll find out here. Uh, the opposition called them Methodists. They didn't like the name. But eventually that's what they became known as. Who was it they in the opposition? Uh, basically the state church, the, the already established Anglican church in England. For the most part, yeah. Anybody? Uh, another uh, besides list? Anything else? Yeah, work, uh, work righteousness. Okay. Um, I I always have the the term in my head, uh, discipline. Uh, now they're not very disciplined anymore, <laughs> but uh, they used to have, uh, and and they are the first group we can really say are, uh, uh, after all the ones we've looked at, this is the first group that's really more American than it is anything else. I mean, you could say the first Methodist societies were in England, but the first congregations, the first Methodist congregations were really an American invention. Uh, and really it took off, and, and, and the denomination really didn't uh, blossom until it took, took root in the United States. In the, in the early colonies. Uh, we will find that they and the Baptists too, same way. Uh, Methodists and Baptists are an American invention, whereas most all the other Christian denominations uh, are um, uh, European. Uh, but uh, as far as large uh, mainline denominations, Baptists and Methodists are both uh, come from uh, American soil, shall we say. And, and you'll see how that, how that worked out uh, as we go through here. Yeah? Is the controversy within the Methodist Church now the first real big... No. Oh my goodness, no. No. No, the, the split that is uh, really already kind of taken place, even though it hasn't been um, authorized or approved, but the split that is taking place in the United Methodist Church today is just one of many that they've had over the years. Uh, the biggest one before this was over slavery. And so you had the, the Southern Methodist Church and the Northern Methodist Church. Uh, and uh, that, that was over slavery, and that did not get healed for a long time. It was uh, years and years after the war between the states be, between, before the two sides uh, uh, finally got back together again. Uh, so that was a big difference. There were also other big differences, uh, not quite so divisive, but there were other big differences uh, before that and after that. And now today, the, the big difference is over uh, homosexuality, uh, transgenderism, and, and all that. That seems to be the big, the big difference today. And uh, it, it has pretty much already split the church. Again, that hasn't been formalized, but uh, it, I'm sure it will be, if not this year, next year. Uh, I'm sure. But a lot of churches are just going ahead and leaving the United Methodist Church uh, formally. They're voting to leave already. So they're not waiting for the convention to decide this. So, all right, let us move on then. Um, 
The Methodists is all about, not so much about Calvin anymore. Now we're moving on from, from the early reformers to the next generation. The Wesleys are the next generation of reformers. Okay, the first generation of reformers, Luther and uh, Calvin and Knox, uh, those guys, they are dead now. Uh, they are moved on. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Protestant church is established in England as the Anglicans. The Presbyterians are in Scotland. Uh, and uh, the Lutherans in uh, Germany. And the Dutch Reformed are in the Netherlands and Denmark and uh, some other in Sweden. Uh, but uh, those are the groups that you have right now. Uh, and we're going to concentrate on what happens in England and what happens with the Anglican Church um, uh, because of some political things that took place. Number one, by the time of the Council of Trent was opened, the Roman Catholic Church had to address the defection of the Church of England as well as that of the churches in northern Germany, so the Lutherans and the Anglicans. Initially, the English Reformation under Henry VIII and Edward VI had instituted few lasting results. The church of Henry VIII was no different than the Roman church he left. The church of Edward VI was very much like the Lutheran church of northern Germany. So not much had, and the Lutheran church of north Germany was very much like the Roman church. Remember, all Luther did was to take out prayers to Mary, prayers for the dead, prayers to the saints. That's about it. The mass remained almost the same, exactly the same, and the same in the Anglican church. Under, Ed, under Henry VIII. The Mass remained the Mass. It's, it, the only thing Henry took out was, was a few of those, those things like you know, prayers for the dead and stuff like that. Otherwise, it stayed the same. So as far as the outward appearance of the church for the first hundred years of the Reformation, none of the breakaway groups did anything really as far as the outward you know, the show, the, the, the service, worship, whatever. No, nobody did anything that was really very noticeable. You couldn't really tell much had happened. I mean, you could tell maybe from the sermons but, and the prayers, but that's about it. You, you couldn't really tell otherwise. Okay? Now, during the reign of Elizabeth, the permanent changes were established in the English church. For some, however, these reforms did not go far enough. So I would have to say Elizabeth's worship didn't look all that much different from Henry's. A little bit. A few more changes thrown in. But for the most part, still uh, pretty much like the old Roman mass. Not, not much different. Uh, Elizabeth tried to force the dissenters to accept her reformation, but they continued to voice their disapproval. In other words, people were acting like Karlstadt in Germany and Knox in, in Scotland. They were saying, look, if the Romans are wrong about all this stuff, they're wrong about purgatory, they're wrong about transubstantiation, they're wrong about Mary, they're wrong about you know, uh, uh, indulgences, etc. They're wrong about these things. Then we should make a stark break. In other words, people should be able to look at our worship and, and what we do, and they should be able to say, wow, that's big different from what's going on at, you know, St. Albans uh, Roman Church, okay? That was, that was their, and I'm going to use this word a lot in the next months, okay? That was their feeling, okay? Their feeling was, we don't look and sound different enough. If we're really different than the Romans, we ought to act different. We ought to look different. We ought to talk different. We ought to worship different. We ought to sing different. We ought to... They, people should be able to tell right away, boy, that's not Roman. Instead of walking in like people do to our service to this very day, walk in and go, oh, hey, this is a lot like Roman church. Yeah. Well, of course it is. Because Luther's Reformation was a very conservative Reformation. He didn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Okay? So, uh, uh, again, people just, they were, they were itching for more change. Okay? And they wanted their change to appeal to their feelings and emotions. That's, that was what's going on. Okay? Uh, so in uh, 1689, the Act of Toleration brought the religious struggles for most English dissenters to an end. So Elizabeth said, look, you want to be a Quaker, you can be a Quaker. 
well, she was dead by this time, but, but uh, uh, at, at, at this point, uh, uh, you've got uh, some, um, you, you, you had the English Civil War, you've had the execution of Charles I, you've had the restoration of Charles II, you had a couple idiot, uh, well, James II, and, his, and then you had the, what's called the Glorious Revolution, which was a bloodless revolution, one of the few in the world. Uh, then you had William uh, uh, come over from Orange over in Germany or, or Netherlands with Anne, who was a Stuart, uh, Queen Anne, uh, and uh, William and Mary, excuse me, uh, not Anne, Mary, William and Mary, and, and they came over, uh, and uh, this brought uh, a kind of a moderation. And then the Act of Toleration was passed, which meant if you want to be a uh, uh, Anglican great, you want to be in the church, that's fine. If you want to be a Quaker by that time, you want to be a Puritan by that time, that's okay. You want to be a Baptist by that time, it's okay. You want to be a Methodist by that time, that's okay. Even though those terms were not always used. So the Act of Toleration was, by the way, the Act of Toleration applied to everybody except, anybody, anybody, anybody? The Romans. Didn't apply to the Romans. As a Roman Christian, if you, if you were a Roman Catholic in England, after 1689, you still could not vote. You could not vote. You could not own property. Uh, you could not serve in the military. You could not serve in the constabulary. Uh, there were all kinds of restrictions. And those restrictions stayed until the 1800s. Uh, England uh, was a very, very anti-Roman uh, uh, country for a long time. Uh, and I think that's basically because of all the plots like the gunpowder plot, you're all familiar with the gunpowder plot, and you know that face you see all the time with the little mustache, right? Right? You know, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what's that called? What's that? Called? What's that guy's called? What's that guy's called with the mask? Ah, uh, shoot. Uh, Guy Fox. Guy Fox. And then there's another. There's a. There's a term they made a movie, and the guy used that in the movie. Well, I, I didn't see the movie, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. V for Vendetta. Yes, V for Vendetta, and that's a Guy Fox mask. That mask had been around uh, since the Gunpowder Plot was against James II. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, yeah, the the Gunpowder Plot, fifth of November. Yeah, big big deal. You go over to England today, big party. I mean, it looks like our Fourth of July, big time. Okay, because that's when the Gunpowder Plot was discovered and and fizzled out, basically. They were going to blow up Parliament. When uh, James was going to start Parliament, you know, the king or the queen always goes to Parliament and starts it off, you know, kicks it off. And so when all the parliamentarians, House of Lords, and the House of Commons, and the king, and all of his family, and everybody else was all in one place, right? They didn't have that lone survivor uh, 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 policy yet, <laughs> okay? And Guy Fox and his, uh, his, his Roman Catholic uh, friends had gone and down in the basement and they'd put tons of black powder down there. And they were ready to set it off. They were discovered. And uh, so, yeah, when they were discovered, then he was hung, of course, and his friends. And, and so that's a real big holiday in England, real big. And uh, it was big because it was seen as a, as a great victory against the Pope and those crazy papists. And uh, mostly the legislation in England that's anti-Roman doesn't say anti-Roman or even anti-Catholic. It says anti-Papists. The big enemy is really the Pope, not anybody else. Okay. Oh, just a sidelight there. Uh, unfortunately, the end of these 17th century struggles was marked by a general spiritual lethargy. That's important to note. People were real... Uh, involved in trying to get the country to pick one religion. Okay? A lot of people were working hard. The Lutherans were working hard. The Presbyterians were working hard. The Armenians were working hard. The Anglicans were working hard. Everybody was working their tails off to get the country to pick just one religion. Okay? And instead, William and Mary came over and they said, yeah, let's be tolerant. Let's tolerate. You, you can be whatever you want to be. Well, what, what effect did that have on the population? The population basically said, oh, really? 
These are our leaders. These are, this is our king and our queen and all the people in the House of Lords and all the people in the House of Commons. And they all approved overwhelmingly to tolerate any religion you wanted, pretty much, except for Romanism. And so a lot of people, not the Romans, of course, they were still persecuted, but a lot, of, all the Protestants all said, eh, what's the point? If everybody's right, remember how that goes? Right? If everybody, huh? That's right. And so what's the point? Why, why bother? And, and this attitude, this spiritual apathy sunk in to the society, it just, I mean, by the time you get to Dickens, 100 years down the road, okay, it, it's a mess. I mean, I'm sure if you've read any Dickens, if you've seen any uh, uh, movie adaptations or whatever, you look at that, if you've ever seen The Christmas Carol and the way people act, uh, not the rich people, but the rest of the people, if you see how grubby they are, money grubby they are, how immoral they are, how just, I mean, you have no idea. When you look at America today, and you look at like the cities today, and, and you see a rise in crime and all this kind of stuff, it's a drop in the bucket to what English society was throughout the 17 and well, mostly 1800s, for about 200 years. English society was disgusting. There's no two ways about it. There's, I mean, there's no, there's no apology. There's no excuse. Churches were empty, just as empty as they are now. Maybe a little bit less empty, but they're pretty much, except for Christmas and maybe Easter. But, but ch churches were empty. Uh, uh, I, I, society was just uh, a very materialistic, extremely materialistic, extremely amoral, extremely unethical, extremely bigoted and prejudiced. These are the years of debtor prisons where entire families could be thrown into debtor prison and, and uh, they had to work off their debt in prison for pennies uh, a week. They would live and die. Uh, we have their stories of entire generations of people living and dying in, in debtor's prison. I mean, folks, as bad as things are in America, they ain't as bad as they were at this time in, in England, which gives rise, one of the things that gives rise to the Methodists. Um, rationalism had perm, uh, penetrated all classes of religious thinkers so that Christianity seemed little more than a system of morality supported by divine sanctions. Okay? So it was a system of morality, but a system that was rejected because the divine sanctions didn't have any teeth used to be the government would back up God's commands. Okay? Now the government basically ignored God's commands, except for certain ones Then they went overboard on. There were able preachers, but the sermon is usually a colorless essay on moral virtues. And you know what? The more you preach on good works, the more you preach on morals, the more you preach on ethics, the less ethical the people could become. That's a fact, Jack. I can tell you that. I can promise you that. If I, if I preached a, a sermon series of six months on nothing but morals and ethics, I guarantee you, you would get so sick and tired of being told what to do, you'd be so sick and tired of being told you better be this, you better be that, da 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 you just wouldn't, you'd just stop showing up because ugh, we don't need that. But that's what it was, and it wasn't just for six months. It was for years. Okay. There was no gospel, no gospel motivation, right? Um, outreach work was scanty. Why bother? Besides which, society was stratified to the rich, 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 and the poor, poor, poor. And the middle class hadn't really taken off yet. I mean, it was getting there, but it hadn't taken off yet. And nobody wanted to be anywhere around the poor by any stretch of the imagination. The poor, frankly, were diseased by quite a bit. The poor, uh, by and large, were dishonest. 
the poor, uh, by and large, were unethical. Uh, uh, they were um, without uh, religious or spiritual thinking at all. Nobody wanted them around, and nobody wanted them to come to church. Okay, stay out. Right, kind of like the homeless today. Right, you want to do work among the homeless. You understand, understand that you're going to be dealing very often, not always, but very often you're going to be dealing with people that have a, not not a clue of of your spiritual milieu, your spiritual viewpoint of things. Okay. Uh, and, and so the work is going to be a lot more difficult than you think. It's, not, it's going to be more difficult than it is among pagans, for example. Okay? You're doing work, uh, 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 I'm told by missionaries, I'm told that doing work in India, for example, among the uh, outcasts, the unclean, right? at least they have a very clear spiritual understanding. But these same missionaries who will come back to the United States and say volunteer work for uh, uh, the inner uh, cities of Chicago or New York or Philadelphia, that's not what they find. And, and they tell our pastors' conferences, these missionaries will say, it's much more difficult doing work in, in inner city of Philadelphia than it is in Calcutta. That's, that's saying something, folks. That, 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 that's, a, that's a pretty stark comment right there. Wow. Okay. So British society was a lot this way. The, the poor were a lot this way. And again, there were rich and there was poor. And the middle class is starting to be created, but it's got a ways to go. Um, the condition of the lower caste was one of spiritual destitution. They were just destitute. They, they were, their, their, their spirits were empty, basically. Of, of spiritual thinking, of spiritual motivation, of spiritual ideas. They're just empty. And, and that makes perfect sense. They, they didn't go to church. And they're all Baptists. Let me say that. They were all Baptists. Okay? That was a big deal back in that, those days. And so make sure they were all baptized. But that was it. That was probably the last time any of these people saw the inside of a church. Uh, popular amusements were coarse. Illiteracy was widespread. Laws were savage in their enforcement, like the debtor prisons. Jails were sinkholes of disease. Drunkenness was more widespread than any other time in English history. And that's a pretty amazing statement when you think about the pubs in the 1800s and 1900s and how many there are. You can't go to any place in England and not see a string of pubs. I mean, boy, the English like their warm beer. I don't know exactly why. But they're really into that warm beer. Um, they like their pints of Guinness, just like the Irish. But uh, to say that their drinking is worse here in the 1700s than it is in the 1900s is a pretty amazing statement. But again, this is what you're dealing with. So you can imagine, you know, and so the rich are going to church, they're going to church in their carriages, and they're all dressed up real nice, and the preacher's up there talking about how good they are, and how good they need to be, and so on and so forth, and, and uh, no gospel motivation, no evangelism motivation, no, none of that kind of stuff, and they get back out, and they get in their carriages, and they go home, okay? And along the way, they see the destitute, and the, the poverty-stricken, and the prostitutes, and the flower girls, like May Fair Lady, and My Fair Lady, you know, kind of thing. And, and they see all that, and they, you know, they, they, they put their handkerchiefs to their nose. And this is where snuff gets to be really important. You realize that? Where snuff came from? Snuff came from the fact that a lot of these rich people had to go through very poor areas in order to get to certain of their destinations. And they couldn't stand the smell. And you couldn't either, by the way. I mean, these were people that lived their whole life without taking a bath. You remember that scene in My Fair Lady where, where, uh, where uh, uh, Professor Higgins is going to give her a bath? And, and, and she says, you mean wet all over? <laughs> well, yes. You've got to take your clothes off. So you could tell, you know, and if you read Pygmalion, the, the original, you, uh, you, uh, the woman's never had her clothes off. I mean, right? I mean, you know, best they could do is, you know, a, a cat bath. You know, that's about it. You know, a lick and a promise, as they say, my mother used to call it. Uh, so so the, the society is just completely different. Uh, totally, completely. All right? 
Uh, so yeah, yeah, snuff, snuff up your. So ooh, you don't have to smell that smell. Well, and the sewers by this time uh, in England, at like London in the 1700s, they're starting to be put underground. But there's still a lot of places in London where they weren't. They just ran right down the middle of the city uh, street. Um, Great Britain stood on the eve of the Industrial Revolution, which transformed the country in the last. A third of the 18th century from a collection of medieval agriculture communities to a modern manufacturing state. Early in the 18th century, there were many men and movements looking toward better things. A lot of people, this is the time where the people like Salvation Army gets going. This is the time when the Quakers are starting to reach out into communities and, and serve the, 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 the poor uh, and stuff like that. This is a time where a lot of people are seeing the need. But they're not able to do much really at this point yet. Uh, some efforts were also underway for a return to more religious life. Among the revivalists, here you go, among the revivalists were the societies, the earliest of which formed by a group of young men in London about 1678 for prayer, reading the scriptures, the cultivation of religious life, frequent communion. Please note that. You will see this run through the history of Methodism. I know this is a surprise to most Lutherans, but the very beginnings of Methodism started with a great appreciation and a great desire for frequent communion. You don't see that too much in the Methodist Church today, but you used to, this, this was the beginnings of the movement was our, focused around frequent Lord's Supper. Uh, aid to the poor, soldiers, uh, prisoners, encouraging and preaching. These groups multiplied rapidly. By 1700, there were 100 in London alone. They found many other parts of England and Ireland. In many ways, these society resembled Jacob Spainer's uh, Collegia Pietas. Uh, this was uh, 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 Pietist fellowships in Germany. Uh, this was the time of Pietism in Germany. When the same things were happening in German society, not maybe quite so uh, stark, but still they were happening. And uh, Spainer and his guys, a uh, guy by the name of Franke, uh, Spainer and Franke and uh, Count von Zinzendorf and the Moravians and others, they kind of, they looked around and they saw, you know, we really got to do something about this. Pe people are not very spiritual. People are not very religious. Uh, the churches are, again, pretty empty. Uh, nobody's going to communion. Uh, nobody's studying the Bible. Um, you know, it, let's, let's prove this. And so there was no, as far as we know, there was no correspondence between the London religious societies and the uh, uh, pietist cells in Germany. As far as we know, there was no connection. Now, people were traveling in those days, especially merchants, and so there's certainly possible that merchants from England could have gone to Germany, seen that, and taken that back. But we have no proof of that in history. They also had no Spainer to lead them. Spainer was very, very uh, outgoing. He was a very, very fiery guy. Uh, he was like the, the future Whitefield uh, in, in America later on, and the Wesley boys. Um, and he was one guy, and he was very energetic. He and Franke both, and they really led the Pietist movement. Uh, very from the front. <laughs> they, they, they led from the front, not from the back. <laughs> uh, they were composed almost entirely of communicants of the established state church, the Anglican church. Many clergy looked upon the societies as enthusiastic or fanatical. Enthusiastic in the German word, uh, 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 escapes me. Enthusiasts. Um, ah! I'll think, it'll come to me. Uh, even as a spiritual lethargy, the mass of English people was uh, quite conscious of sin and convinced of the reality of the future reward and retribution. So your average, uh, your average uh, Englander, or Londoner, or whatever, knew they were sinners. That much they knew. Just overhearing preaching, they, they knew that. Uh, and they also knew that if you're good, you go to heaven, and if you're bad, you go to hell. That much they knew. Again, that's, of course, a simplification and a wrong theology, but that's what they thought. So they didn't go to church, they didn't go to Sunday school, they didn't read the Bible, they didn't, you know, participate in religious stuff. But they knew they were sinners, and they knew they better be good, 
uh, they were just kind of incapable of doing it. You know, they just, it was hard. Being good was hard. And being good made, meant also that they felt you had to sacrifice the few pleasures of life. Uh, of which drink and prostitution were one and two. Which is also why syphilis was three. Unfortunately. Um, even, uh, yet, living in loyalty to Christ, salvation through Him alone, and vibrant, transforming faith had not been aroused. They saw, they saw no reason, they saw no motivation for sacrificing uh, booze and prostitutes and whatever. Um, and if they died uh, of syphilis in their 30s or 40s, eh, they didn't care. They really didn't care. Life was miserable. Life was disgusting. Life was, life was gruesome. And, and uh, so, you know, they weren't looking forward to living to old age. They didn't care. So if his disease took them before that, so much the better. Let's party hardy. Let's have a good time because we won't be around long. That, that was the attitude. The development of this consciousness was primarily work of three men the brothers John and Charles Wesley and George Whitefield. The parents of the Wesleys were nonconformists, that is, dissenters. So these were pre Baptists. These were people who did not like the uh, pomp and circumstance of the Anglican Church. They did not like the Romanisms in the Anglican Church. They did not even care for the kneeling and stuff in the Presbyterian Church. They were dissenters. They were rebels. Okay? They didn't like that. Both grandfathers had been ejected from the Anglican clergy in 1662. Their father Samuel had preferred, however, to remain within the ministry of the established church, Church of England. Their mother, too, was a devout Anglican who bore, get this, 19 children. This is not unusual in pre-Victorian England. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 children, not unusual at all. Uh, you would expect a third of them, or a quarter of them at least, to not make it past two or three. This also gave, uh, this also made parents a little bit, I won't say neglectful, but parents were a little bit, uh, how should we say, not showing, not warm and fuzzy. Hmm? Um, you can't necessarily expect your newborn to be around a long time. And so better not to get attacked. Too much. Um, and that, that attitude you see especially among the higher classes who also had lots of children of whom who also a lot of them died. Being rich did not give you better infant mortality or uh, mother mortality. A lot of rich, uh, uh, rich uh, women died in childbirth and a lot of children died in childbirth right after who were very wealthy, including uh, parts of the royal family. So the, having a lot of money in, in those years, it wasn't a great advantage as far as your, your projected uh, uh, survival was concerned. Okay? Um, uh, eight of who died in infancy. Again, pretty normal. And so mothers were distant from their children. Fathers, especially, too, were distant from their children. Uh, it was a rare thing for a parent, a mother or father, to be really close, really affectionate, really huggy, clingy kind of thing to their kids. Very rare indeed. So you had an entire generation growing up. I mean, we, we complain about latchkey kids uh, at certain points in our history. These weren't even latchkey kids. Uh, these were kids basically told to go and you know, find something to do. Um, parents just didn't really care. Um, if you made it past five, fine. They would make you an apprentice someplace. And kids started working when they were six and seven. That was very normal. Um, John was born, uh, uh, was the 15th. Charles was the 18th. 
Both boys were saved from the burning of the rectory or parsonage in 1709 with a great deal of difficulty. John would therefore regard himself as a brand snatched from the fires of hell. He liked to use that in sermon illustrations. Both boys distinguished themselves in school. In 1720, John entered Christ Church, Oxford, and Charles followed him there six years later. In 1725, John was ordained a deacon, but from then until his conversion, he struggled spiritually. From 1726 to 29, John was mostly his father's assistant. During this period, uh, in 1728, he was ordained a priest. During John's absence from Oxford in the midst of spring of 29, Charles Wesley, along with Robert Kirkham and William Morgan, found, uh, formed a little club, primarily to help them in their studies. But soon they were engaged in reading helpful books and held frequent communion. Get that. See, there again it pokes up its head. Kind of interesting. On his return to Oxford in November of 29, John Wesley became the leader of the group and it soon tracked other students. Under John's direction, they pursued the ideals of a consecrated life. Under Morgan's influence, they began to visit prisoners in the Oxford jail. The members fasted and pursued ideals that went far beyond what others were doing. They were ridiculed, get this, I love this, they were ridiculed by the university and called the Holy Club. We would probably say today, Holy Rollers, what's our Holy Rollers, right? Some students finally hit upon a name that stuck, the Methodist. Yet they were far from what Methodism would become. They were a company bent on working out their own salvation. At this point, however, they more resembled Anglo-Catholic movement of the 19th century than later Methodists. Um, in the 1800s, a movement started that did for Catholicism, Romanism, what Methodism did for Anglicanism. And uh, I'm not really intending to get into that in, in this study. Uh, maybe some other time it would be worth uh, viewing, but this is where you had very influential writers and clergy in the Anglican Church convert to Roman Catholicism. Cardinal Newman is the most famous. And man, I'm telling you, when Newman, the great archbishop of, in, uh, um, in uh, Anglicanism, converted to Romanism, uh, it was like the volcano Krakatoa going off throughout the entire British Empire. Uh, and again, sometime maybe we'll, we'll talk about that, that movement, but the Anglo-Catholic movement or Anglo-Roman movement in the uh, 1800s was huge. It influenced uh, guys like J.R.R. Tolkien very much. It influenced... Um, um, oh, C.S. Lewis uh, later, uh, it, it, it influenced other writers of the time, uh, became very famous people. Um, so uh, it was a huge, huge, huge movement. It really was. But the Methodists were first. They were first. They did it to Anglicanism first before that group did it to Romanism. Um, one, one last paragraph, then we'll cut it off. An important addition to the club came in 1735 when George Whitefield, born September 16th, Whitefield was the son of an innkeeper and entered Oxford in 1733. A severe illness in the spring of 35 initiated a religious experience that ultimately brought him peace with God. He came close to death. Uh, he had kind of a deathbed type experience, uh, very, very emotional, very, very... Um, Shatter, uh, mind uh, shattering, spirit altering kind of thing. Um, uh, a man without denominational feeling, he was ready to preach anywhere and everywhere. His message was the gospel of forgiving grace. He promoted peace through the acceptance of Christ by faith and favored a life of joyful service. A large part of his ministry was spent in America. Arriving in Georgia in 1738, his preaching in New England, 1740, introduced the greatest spiritual upheaval ever witnessed in America, I would add, to this day. The so-called Great Awakening. He visited America seven times, finally dying in Newburysport, Massachusetts in 1770. Whitefield actually was no organizer. 
He left no party to bear his name, but he did awaken thousands. He was a Methodist, but some people refer to him today as a Baptist. Uh, he was a revivalist, basically, in lack of a better term. Uh, he was the first American revivalist and created a very unique, a very clearly separate, different type of religion than was in Europe. Whitefield was the first American Christian, if you will. Truly American. Homegrown, really. Homespun. Uh, he sharpened his, his, uh, his oratory in frontier uh, camp meetings. Uh, he was really uh, the first uh, in what we would today refer to as an American spiritualist or an American Christian or an American religious leader of some kind. Um, he really was. He really was the first. And all the ones after, from Billy Sunday to Billy Graham and Franklin Graham today and Jerry Falwell and Jimmy Swagger and Pat Robertson and all the rest of them can't hold a candle uh, to George Whitefield. He, he probably converted more people, brought in more people, baptized more people, uh, had bigger influence on the country uh, as a person, including the Founding Fathers, uh, than any other human being. And uh, we could do a life of Whitefield and it would be very entertaining. But uh, we don't have time for that. So we'll cut it off there and we'll pick it up uh, at the Methodist Club of Oxford next time. Paragraph 10. Questions, comments? Let's close. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all. Amen. Thank you. You betcha. You bet. <laughs> Morning, dear. How are you today? Fine Allergies. Oh. Yeah. The wind blew yesterday. I knew it was going to be bad. And, you, you take know. anything for it? Or? Uh, Fexofinidine. I was thinking that, a little bit of that, but uh, that's about it. Uh, that helps. But I've been taking my allergy shots, my antibiotics oh, now for years. Oh, okay. Years, it I, does make a big Does it? Uh, yeah. I may have to look into that. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs>